Hi everyone and welcome to this presentation about mirroring public key infrastructures to blockchains for on-chain authentication. This has been uh, a joint work together with Frederike Groschup and Florian Mattes at the Technical University of Munich. And let's start. Um, so looking at the outline, we're first going to start to talk about the motivation and research questions. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the transportation, the transport layer security. Then we're going to talk about the system design and architecture, um, talk about the evaluation of the system and conclude and talk a little bit about the future work. So what is this all about? So the communication in Web 2.0 or in the internet itself is quite um, yeah, unknown to the user. So um, the computers itself communicate via IP addresses with the IP um, v4 protocol and these numbers are not really human readable. So um, some of you may know the domain name server for uh, Google 4444, but um, the user does not really know which um, services belong to, um, which IP addresses belong to the services they want to communicate with. So um, we, um, as a community, developed technologies like domain name systems uh, or the transport layer security or certificate standards like X509 and others to allow human readable domains. So for example, in this picture here, like uh, Wikipedia or the IFCA. Um, and these systems have become widely adopted in the last 20, 30 years. So um, this is really what every end user is using in their daily life and um, everyone who has a mobile phone or a smartphone is uh, is knowing about the systems and trusting their 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 reliability and um, with uh, for example TLS we're really able to also not um, um, yeah assign names to domains or to servers but are also able to um, secure the communication between the participants so that it's encrypted, that it cannot be tampered with, and so on and so forth. And um, blockchain systems like Bitcoin, or in our case, Ethereum, really face same issues as in the early uh, World Wide Web. So if you want to interact with services with smart contracts or want to send uh, funds to other users, you need to rely on this 40 character long address here in uh, Ethereum. And this is really a hard to grasp concept for a lot of uh, users or for a lot of people who are not really familiar with the technology um, because it really complicates um, the whole system and um, even a small typing error can uh, lead to yeah, devastating losses. And so copy pasting and sending these addresses via email or other uh, means is really the way how we currently handle uh, these addresses in the system. And uh, we believe that authenticating Ethereum addresses and their owners uh, would allow for new applications and also would promote trust in the information and the services that are provided on the blockchain. So if you could imagine to say, okay, it would be much more easier to say, okay, I wanna transfer 1.5 ether to some domain than instead to some weird address or Token contracts could, for example, only allow um, anyone to participate with the respective domain. So in this case, .gov. But you could also imagine some whitelisting there. You could um, imagine uh, many different things. Or, for example, that a contract is owned by some university, in this case, uh, the TUM here. And we see this on, we see this, this on issue. So there are some, some approaches to solve this. Um, but we see systems, for example, like ENS, as um, they, they really lack the bootstrapping and have a slow adoption. And um, that really leads to um, yeah, a, missing, a missing spot for, for such identity solutions. And our key idea and our key contribution in this paper is to think about leveraging established TLS certificates and public key infrastructures for identity solutions in an on-chain environment. So that's really what we are trying to do. And um, there have been some related work on, on that issue. And um, we want to briefly mention them. They're also mentioned in more detail uh, in the paper you find online. Um, the blockchain-based 
in public key solutions, there are some um, solutions available. And the majority of them of research papers, they're really trying to improve public key infrastructure solutions by leveraging the blockchain technology. So you could imagine by being able to have more transparency um, in the system, um, it becomes more easy to understand what's going on and also detect malicious entities, for example. Um, other public key infrastructure systems that build on blockchain, they rely more on the web of trust component. So um, you know uh, maybe um, yeah, older web of trust solutions like the PGP system and they want to leverage and they want to reboot the web of trust with uh, blockchain-based solutions. Um, also further approaches, we saw some certificate auditing as already mentioned and also some um, game theoretic modeling. So um, having some kind of insurance properties in the system so that you can be sure that um, yeah, the incentives of um, the certificate issues are, for example, aligned with the um, domain owners. But we do not really see any migration of existing structures or existing public key infrastructures to the chain in, in some kind of an on-chain environment so that you could use it. Um, one example, and I think the most famous and most well-known example in the Ethereum space is the Ethereum name service, um, the ENS system. And um, they also want to allow human readable names and they allow you to use um, domain names with the top level domain .eth. And um, it, it seems that there is a lot of uh, going on in this community and this community is very vibrant and a lot of people are using um, ENS, for example, um, putting their names, their handles in their in the Twitter accounts. Um, but outside of this community, there is not, not really an adoption there. And this is so the main, the main big problem, the large problem that they really have this bootstrapping issues. On the other hand, like the TLS certificate um, system is really widely adopted in almost every business worldwide or every entity that has a domain and really relies on the system. Um, a fun fact to mention, um, the ENS um, uh, community or the ENS developer team work on integration of the DNSSEC into, the, into ENS. So this would also allow them to use um, real world or regular domains in an on-chain environment. Coming to our research questions, we asked ourselves um, how can naming attributes of existing public key infrastructures in an on-chain blockchain context be leveraged? So um, properties of certificates, the naming attributes, the domain names, how can we use them uh, on-chain? And also what are the constraints of leveraging these existing uh, PKIs in a blockchain environment? And to uh, start with that, I first wanna briefly talk about the transport layer security. Um, to give you a little bit of background. Um, so first of all, this is often used TLS certificates and public key infrastructure is um, used in the daily life of everyone who um, is using the internet and it allows you to authenticate servers. So you want to know, um, you want to talk to the server who is behind example.com for example and um, the server provides you with a, a certificate with a public key and also a signature that you're able to verify that. So the public key infrastructure basically binds the public key to a domain name and these certificates are issued by certification authorities. So um, these certificate authorities are also pre-installed in your machine or in your browser um, so that you, can, that you can be sure that they are trustworthy, so to say. And with the signature and this um, public key that um, you have, you can verify that the signature is in fact correct. And the um, user has, yeah, so to say, um, three key variables um, to decide whether a certificate is valid. And that's first of all, the time of validation. So is the certificate not expired? Um, the integrity of the certificate in its certificate chain, so is the certificate in fact issued by a certificate authority that you trust? And um, or, or if it's in integrate and in, in, it has integrity, and the third party is um, the third part is whether they trust the root certificate. So do you really trust the issue here? And um, if not, then the certificate is deemed valid by the user. And this is happening each day uh, millions of times every time you connect to a website. 
So let's talk a little bit about the system design and architecture here. Um, we have three um, components here. So we first have a claim and endorsement structure. That's an own data type we propose. Then we have a, a certificate database and a endorsement database. So let's start with the claim and the endorsement. The claim itself is a file or a, 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 a data type that describes a link between an Ethereum address and a fully qualified domain name. So um, it's, it's the, 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 term, the term domain is often used um, not in a correct sense. So the fully qualified domain name is the, um, the right word for a, for example, a www.example.com is a FQDN. And the claim contains the address, so the address of the endorsed account um, that, the, that is stored on chain. I'd, um, this is the smart contract, so to say, you want to um, have endorsed by the domain, then you definitely need the uh, FQDN itself. So you want to know which domain you are um, vouching for, so to say. And um, we also provide an identifier of the certificate um, so that you're able to easily retrieve the certificate and an optional expiration date. So that is also makes sense if you want your smart contract or this endorsement to, to expire. Um, the endorsement itself contains uh, the claim and the proof that the claim is correct. So also a signature um, over the information that is uh, stored in the claim signed by the private key of the TLS certificate. And this endorsement uh, is stored in a smart contract and can be uh, retrieved by verifiers later on. Uh, we have a on-chain X509 certificate storage and validation system. So um, you can imagine we can use um, the certificates only then in an on-chain context when we also have um, all the certificates that are required um, to issue or verify these um, these endorsement or these con uh, or these these uh, domain certificates, we need them all on the blockchain, and therefore we leverage um, the system here and the this um, database, so to say, stores the complete certificate chain for a new certificate, and each certificate must be stored only once and root certificates can be added by anyone. So this is a little, seems a little bit um, counterintuitive, counterintuitive. Why can root certificates be added by anyone? The reason for this is that um, a verifier, when they want to verify a um, certificate, they have to um, explicitly state um, which um, uh, root certificate they trust. And this allows you to not only um, use the regular TLS system but uh, or a public key infrastructure, but you can use any public key infrastructure you like. So you can also create your own public key infrastructure and um, input this information onto the blockchain and use the respective uh, certificate um, uh, root certificates um, as a trust anchor, so to say. We have um, four operations defined. So we have a create, read, update, and delete. Um, um, functions available. So the creation um, is um, that we are allowing uh, certificates um, to be submitted and they are verified in accordance with RFC 5280. Um, and um, if they are not able to be verified, then they are um, rejected. We can read certificates by providing a unique certificate and ident identifiers. So this is what I meant previously with the certificate fingerprint. Um, you can use this to find certificates. The update is functionality is strictly limited to um, update the revocation status of the certificate. So you can think about uh, certificate revocation lists or uh, OCSP um, protocol that allows you to verify whether a certificate is still valid or if it's revoked by um, the respective parties. The deletion of certificates are not allowed because there could be some kind of dependability um, yeah, that would break some other systems if you would delete certificates. And um, in this um, upper, upper right image here, you can see I, the idea behind the central um, storage. So it's logically decentralized, but on the chain, it's a centralized smart contract. 
And um, if you assume that you have won a root certificate, and then you could that someone could um, want to issue um, the, or want to store a one on the on the um, on the blockchain, and they would have to provide two um, certificates, so a and a one. But um, if someone wants then to provide um, certificate a two, then they only have to upload this single um, certificate because all other certificates have already been submitted to the system. So this allows us to really have a um, yeah, to reduce the storage cost overall. Let's talk about the on-chain endorsement validation. So the endorsement validation requires previously as in, uh, um, in the um, background about transportation, a uh, transport layer security um, requires uh, three um, steps. So first of all, the signer certificate needs to be valid, the signature, um, that is has been uh, created by this uh, certificate has to be valid and you need to have this trusted root authority. So you need to know whether you trust this root authority or not. And um, this brings us to the idea of an endorsement database. So again, we have a, a logically um, centralized smart contract, but it's decentralized in the blockchain network. So there is no kind of owner or administrator of the smart contract. And um, it basically boils down to the same um, CRUD operation. So we can create endorsements and these endorsements are again verified using the certificate storage. Um, you can read um, these um, endorsements either by finding the account address or by the respective uh, domain name. Um, updates itself, um, uh, you cannot endorse, uh, you cannot update endorsements, so because they are immutable, and again, only you can update the location information. Also, you cannot really delete endorsements, or you cannot delete endorsements as um, third party apps or some other systems might rely on them, even if they are expired. So, also, expired endorsements can be a source of valuable information, and therefore, we do not allow them to be um, deleted. So let's take a look at the evaluation of the system. Um, we um, took a deep dive at the TLS um, public key infrastructure and um, we um, were uh, thankfully granted access to the census database um, to conduct this research. Um, we have two datasets. Um, the dataset S1 contains all valid certificates on the 21st of April 2020. That's the left side here. And we um, provide you with some numbers here. So domain certificates and certificate authority certificates. And um, so to say levels, different levels of certificates. So this is the, so to say the, the chain length to the um, root certificate. And this is, for example, as you see here, 203 million certificates are level three certificates. So this is exactly um, what you would assume. And uh, this case here, you have a root certificate, you have an intermediary certificate and a domain certificate. So that's exactly um, these level three certificates here. And um, we did some analysis on this data set. And the main contribution here is really to see that the verification of these certificates become cheaper over time as the top five intermediary certificates cover 91% um, of all domain certificates. So this is really a huge centralization within the TLS um, structure and um, having this centralized in a smart contract also allows us to leverage this centralization. Um, also the top six uh, certificate authority certificates cover 93 of the domain certificates. So that's also um, very good to see that you can um, verify a lot of certificates um, with only a few intermediary or um, uh, certificate authority certificates. So the trustless, and the trustless centralization of certificate verification has significant cost savings here. The second evaluation we did was to understand how our prototype performed in real world. Um, we had a second um, data set um, from the top 1,000 1, most visited websites. And um, 
that yield um, 869 certificates. And from these certificates, um, about uh, 300 used unsupported algorithms. So if they use ECDSA or some other um, methods that we did not implement, we filtered them out. And from the remaining one, we also included additionally additional intermediary and root certificates. So when there was some dependency there, we also included this and we um, checked if our system could verify these um, certificates here and we were able to um, do that. So um, what we were a little bit afraid of or worried about is that there um, that X509 um, supports a lot of critical extensions that might not be used for every certificate. And um, these um, critical extensions we do not support, um, but it turns out that they are really hardly used, especially in this um, top 1000 most visited websites. Not a single one had an extension that we were not aware of. Coming to the um, performance of the prototype, um, so talking especially about gas costs, so the submission of these 500 um, um, 76 um, certificates yielded that on average um, it cost about 800,000 gas um, per domain certificate and the average cost really sank for a higher number of submitted domain certificates. So that was the average cost here. Um, for comparison, we also implemented it in a decentralized approach set so that all the methodologies and all the verification parts are not stored in a centralized database in, in, in one smart contract, but that any smart contract could do this itself. And you see this um, cost is much, much higher with almost 3 million gas. The cost of submitting an endorsement was about 500,000 gas and the retrieving and validating an endorsement was about 35,000 gas. We have some, uh, some box plot here to get a little bit of an impression of uh, distribution, the distribution of these costs, but also we have to keep in mind, especially when looking at these dollar values, that um, these are numbers from April 2020, so having um, higher costs of the Ether price and having higher gas prices because of the congestion of the Ethereum network really um, yeah, renders, renders this a little bit um, very expensive, so to say. But this is, uh, I think, not an issue that our um, system has solely, but I think any application that currently runs on Ethereum is really, um, really faces these uh, extreme gas costs. Um, we also did some um, thoughts about um, the security of our system and we um, think there are, we identified three um, pillars here. So the security of the system itself. So um, this is a first prototype and therefore it's not really ready for production and code audits should be done to really use it in a, um, in a productive way. Um, we, also did we also decided to um, support um, to not support extension of X509 um, that could harm a little bit the, the system itself because added complexity is always an, an enemy of uh, security. And we also um, took a look at a lot of common security flaws in TLS verification. So we tried to learn from others people's mistakes in that regard. The second pillar is the security of the TLS ecosystem. So um, we think that the TLS system is too big to fail and that there are further developments and enhancements in the system, for example, like uh, certificate transparency that add, a, add, a lot of layer, add another layer of transparency to, to the system. So that allows parties to detect um, maliciously issued certificates. But of course, this is. Um, a security, uh, a port of potential attack vector. And if someone is able to maliciously issue a certificate, it could also be used to um, do this in an on-chain environment. Um, and the third part is the third pillar is the mapping domain names to entities. And I think this is not a problem that is unique to our solution, but that applies to any uh, domain in the World Wide Web. So we talk about 
the main squatting where you try to um, replace some characters, um, for example, a a large I with a, a, a lowercase L, so that you trick people into thinking that this is the real um, website while actually being on a fake um, fake website. So this could also apply to our system. Concluding this paper, um, we think there's a great advantage of using TLS certificates for identity assertion and verification on Ethereum. So there is a massive amount of trusted data available anyone or most of the businesses have such have access to such certificates so um, that is really an advantage here um, we are able to um, do on-chain decisions and i think we also um, showed some interesting use cases in the motivation that can be used and that also require on-chain decisions um, and with migrating the necessary parts of the public key infrastructure on chain, we really um, allow for these use cases. Um, the third part is the, the centralization of the validation and storage of certificates and the endorsements really exploits the characteristics of this TLS ecosystem, avoiding redundancy and reduces uh, the total cost for all stakeholders. And also with, with not really compromising any security here because these smart contracts are not owned by us or by anyone, and they perform as they are intended to. Um, the drawback is a little bit that it's not a fully fledged um, identity management system because only certificate owners can be authenticated, and um, the Ethereum is not really cost optimized for TLS certificates. So, when we looked at these uh, mechanisms, these verification mechanisms, this is all something that is not natively supported by. Ethereum and therefore incur a lot of cost. Also, some might deem the TLS public key infrastructure unreliable or manipulatable, and, and that could also harm the system here. And the future work, um, we try and uh, we work on extending and um, have a detailed testing of the current proof of concept implementation and restructure the internal endorsement scheme to make endorsement retrieval cheaper. Um, we investigate ways to combine TLS-based authentication framework with identity systems speci specifically designed for Ethereum so that you would be able to say we bootstrap the system with a TLS but profit from the, um, the identity system that's already there and designed for Ethereum and also develop a more elaborate endorsement framework. So, for example, we're thinking about chains of endorsements so that you would be able to say, okay, a domain owner can not only endorse a smart contract, but could also account, um, endorse user accounts or um, some identity providers even could use the system to allow for an on-chain verification of people who, not, who do not own um, certificates. That, that's it from our side. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, see each other on the 5th of March at the workshop for trusted smart contracts. Until then, have a good time and see you. Bye-bye.